start, I wanted to recognize a couple groups that are key to our funding. Uh, one being Suffolk County, funds a lot of what we do, as well as the Fish and Wildlife Foundation, who funds our work in the Sound, and then the Peconic Estuary Program, who fund our work in, obviously, the Peconic Estuary. Okay, what is eelgrass? Um, I gave a, a similar talk here about a year ago, um, but if you don't know what eelgrass is, you really should. And the reason why it's, it's a very important species in our marine environment that's disappearing every single day. Uh, the species is Zostera marina. It's a higher plant, just like any plant you'd have in your garden. So if you were to pull it out of the water and look at it, it would look like basically an iris. I'll show you that in a second. But it's one of about 58 species of seagrasses worldwide. Most of them are in the tropics. We have two that live in local waters, Rupia, Maritima, or widgeon grass, and eelgrass, which I'm talking about today. Seagrasses should not be confused with algae, and that's one of the problems I hear a lot. It's, it's an issue with using common names. I get calls or emails saying we're, we see eelgrass or seagrass, and they're often talking about algae here or even things like marsh grasses. Everybody in this room knows the difference between algae and eelgrass and marsh grass, but I just wanted to make that clear because I get that quite a bit. Again, if, you, if I was to uh, recommend the closest plant that you would be very familiar with that is similar to eelgrass, it would be an iris. It grows from a rhizome, it has strap-like leaves, it has roots and nodes. Uh, you can see on the iris here, and this is on the eelgrass, the nodes are where the, the new shoots emerge from. This red circle here shows where the meristem is, the actual the growing point, and that's gonna be important later on as I discuss the impacts of temperature on the species. Eelgrass is a cosmopol cosmopolitan worldwide species. This is the range um, on, it's throughout the world. So basically, we're right here. It grows quite a bit down on the Pacific side, because the Pacific is cooler than the Atlantic in this case, up into Alaska, um, throughout Europe, Asia as well. I've, been, I've done work on the West Coast. I've been to Portugal working on eelgrass. Haven't been to Asia yet, but I hope to do that at some point. Eelgrass and history. Um, there's some pretty interesting stories you probably wouldn't have heard of relating to eelgrass. And one of the most interesting relates to its occurrence in the Baja Peninsula region. There is a group of, of uh, natives there. There's a culture that their whole culture was based on eelgrass. They celebrated eelgrass. They actually would collect the seeds, dry them, make a flower, and make bread from eelgrass seeds. And if you've ever seen an eelgrass seed, it takes a lot, a lot of seeds to make a, a loaf of bread. But um, they would make their sandals from the, the leaves. And their phrase for, or their word for April, is the month when the eelgrass seeds mature. They happen to mature there in April. Here it's June, July, and August. Another interesting story about eelgrass, much closer to home. Early colonists used eelgrass. They were resourceful. They had these large stands of it up on the beach. You've seen that. Probably not so much anymore, but those of us who are up there in age will have remembered seeing this on the south shore, even parts of the Peconics. That's the dead leaves that slough off during the summer. So they didn't want to let that go to waste, so they would use that as a bedding for animals, as a mulch for their crops, also as insulation for their homes. The reason why it works so well is because it's high in silica. It doesn't burn very easily. It doesn't rot quickly as well. You've all heard of Cabot's quilt, Samuel Cabot in the 1890s. Um, one of his first products was, um, was Cabot's quilt, not Cabot's stain. You know about Cabot's stain today, but it was something where they actually took this eelgrass, you see here, and they would put it between layers of craft paper. And again, it was fire retardant, it didn't break down, it didn't smell so great, but it, if you put it in your walls, it really didn't matter. So that was a pretty neat product. And then a little more recently, Frigidaire's first refrigerator used eelgrass to insulate. I can't imagine what that would have smelled like, but again, it's, it's uh, interesting. And then finally, last but not least, um, this is actually not the last one, but, but one of the most interesting ones is Radio City Music Hall and Rockefeller Center actually use eelgrass as a sound dampening material in their walls. So I don't think it's there anymore, but when they did some renovations, they found it there. And then finally, and this relates to Great South Bay, the Columbian Bronze Company in the early 20th century was making propellers, and I think they're still around today in Freeport. I'm not quite sure, but they were a very large company at the time. And they um, developed what they called a weedless wheel. And we all know it today. We've seen it in many places. You've seen trolling motors with this really uh, characteristic swept back blade design. That was something developed to avoid being fouled by eelgrass because 
If you talk to the old timers, there was so much eelgrass in Great South Bay that it clogged everything. Everything got clogged. Your propeller got stuck in it, your boat got stuck in it, your sailboat got stuck in it. There were also issues with the water intakes on the inboards where they developed this, the, um, uh, the southern South Bay strainer, I think they called it, which is a wedge shaped device that would slough the eelgrass leaves off so they wouldn't wrap around the intake for the inboard. So anyway, those are some little interesting anecdotes about eelgrass. Getting to the science of it, um, Again, eelgrass is very different from algae. It needs more light than algae. It needs about a quarter of the light that reaches the surface of the water to reach the bottom. No small feat when you have things like algal blooms, macroalgae, suspended sediments that are causing problems. Temperature is another factor, and a very important factor I'll keep hitting on all afternoon here. The key temperature is about 25 degrees Celsius, which turns out to be 77 Fahrenheit. Um, anything above that is very stressful to eelgrass. It's a cold water species. You saw the distributions, kind of the northern Atlantic, the cold parts of the Pacific, and parts of Asia. The synergistic effects of light and temperature are very important. And as you get increases in temperature, it affects the rate of respiration, which is consuming oxygen, and there, there becomes an imbalance in the plants, and over time they weaken and die. So as you have higher temperatures, which we're experiencing year to year here, we're stressing out the species and, and actually killing it off. Again, long-term exposure, temperatures above 77 can be detrimental. Above 27 are almost always de uh, deadly after a couple days. When we're talking about this region, um, we've heard this already from Carl to a certain extent, but we have the various estuaries. And if nothing else, uh, I just want you to understand that they're very different. So the habitats that are available for eelgrass or any other species are very different in the sound as compared to the Peconic estuary, as compared to the South Shore estuary. So, um, eelgrass persists in all three of these, but in very different ways. I put this uh, table together a while ago for a talk I gave, I think it was the one in Portugal, but I was trying to describe the conditions here, but I'll just briefly go through some of these things, starting in the north, so Long Island Sound, but I just want you to understand the difference in how that impacts the growth of eelgrass. So in terms of a meadow type for eelgrass in Long Island Sound, I would consider it a high energy system. You know the fetch is quite extensive there, the winds can be strong from the northwest, and um, sediment type is important for eelgrass, just like any other plant, it has to grow in some type of substrate. So you wanna have low organic matter. In this case, it grows, it grows mostly in sand and cobble. Uh, the depth range can be quite deep, up to seven meters, because the depth is gonna be determined by the amount of light that can reach the bottom. So the, clear, the more clear the water is, the deeper the, the species can persist. In terms of water clarity, there's a thing we measure called light extinction coefficient. The lower that number is, the better off that the more light that passes through the water column. So that's on the lower side of things. Primary stressor, you could say water quality throughout these things, but the things that I'm trying to deal with when we're planting, things like disturbance. So we know that in many places water quality is sufficient, but we have to put it in a spot where it's not gonna get ripped out by waves or eaten by crabs and what have you. Uh, looking at the Peconic Estuary just quickly, it's more of a sheltered system, less fetch. There are issues with the sediment type. There's more organic matter, which is actually toxic to the growth of the species. The sulfites in organic matter can actually kill it. It's poisonous to the rhizome. Depth range is much shallower. The water isn't as clear as the sound. Temperatures are bathtub-like in some cases, so very high, which is, a, again, a problem. KD is poor. Uh, primary stressors are, again, temperature, light, and to a certain extent, water quality. South Shore, quickly, a coastal lagoon system. Kind of a medium fetch depending on the direction of the wind. The sediments vary depending on proximity to the inlets and the depth is usually pretty shallow. You know the South, Shores, South Shore bays are shallow in general. Uh, temperatures can be very high in the flats, but very cool near the inlets. And if you know anything about the distribution of eelgrass now in Great South Bay and all the, south, uh, the, the southern bays, it, it's near the inlet. So it's near that cool, clear water. Uh, KDs, again, can range quite a bit. So it's up once, typically we want to see anything below about a 0.6. So we're up in the, up to, to one or greater in some areas. Disturbance is human and water quality and uh, temperature as well. So where does eelgrass grow? Quickly, it's cold water species. It grows in almost any bottom type. It can grow in mud, but we can't plant it in mud. And I don't have time to go into that in detail, but just know that that's true. Depth range, again, depends on the amount of light. The size, of the plant is, can vary considerably. It can be six inches tall, it can be six or seven feet tall, depending on where it's growing and what it's exposed to. 
status on Long Island at one time, it was in every harbor, creek, cove, bay. We've now lost 75 to 90 percent in all of our areas. So it's really, really disappearing, especially in the Peconics and to the and Great South Bay as well. The sound, we don't have a really good sense of how much was there, but we have a guesstimate. What we want to do to restore it is to establish founder colonies, to bring it back. Uh, we heard some talks earlier about propagation of species, having these founder populations to get to kick off the restoration. So we're doing the same thing with eelgrass. What caused it to, to disappear? There are a number of things, and again, I could talk for hours about this. One of them, which you may have heard about, is a wasting disease in the early 30s. Obviously, coastal development, anything that introduces nutrients into the water column is a problem. Navigational dredging, dug through where these shallow beds used to be in some of our creeks and, and harbors. Brown tie was a problem, it shades the bottom. Light can't get to this plant that needs a light. Um, boating, shellfishing activities, and the big one, the increasing water temperature. Historic losses, I kind of went over that. Um, current area, these are not accurate by any means, and that's one of the issues that we don't have uh, some really good assessments now. I think. The most recent one we have for the Conakestra is just about 900 to 1,000 acres, but that's down 90% from what it was in about 1930, based on our estimates. Uh, the sound has more, but we're talking about parts of Connecticut as well, so it's not just New York, and a lot of it's around Fishers Island, the, the North Fork of Long Island, and in Connecticut as well. And then the South Shore, that estimate is all over the place. Who knows? We need a new uh, set of aerial overflights to determine the population. We don't know what it is right now. This just gives you an example of what Peconics would have looked like in about 1930, the first year we have actual aerials, and we've kind of done an assessment of what it would have looked like. So the, this beautiful green ribbon around the perimeter is where the eelgrass was. This red is where it was in 2010. Now, we've lost some since then, so it's worse than even this is showing, but kind of gives you an idea of what's happening. It's logical for a cold water species, it's gonna to wanna to go out into the sound, into the ocean, and migrate to the east in this case. One of the things that we do with funding from the Peconic Estuary Program is to monitor the meadows that remain, and to a certain extent, it's pretty depressing because you're watching it disappear, but there are some glimmers of hope, which I'll talk about in a moment, but these are all of our stations that we monitor every year. This is the outlier in, in the western system that we're, I'll be talking about in a moment. This is the, has been the trend since 97, so everything's dropping down. We had a cool uh, summer, I believe it was 2014. I don't show the 15 data on here yet, but some of those populations are actually coming back up. A cool year can really benefit the eelgrass. This uh, BB is Bullhead Bay. This light blue one here dropped out. We almost lost it entirely by 2010. Actually, all of our sampling stations had lost their grass, but there was still grass outside of those stations. Since then, it's actually coming back quite a bit to 30% of the densities that were there and to 75% of the cover, so we're pretty happy about that, and I'll explain that in a moment. Why do we care about eelgrass? Again, it's, it's important habitat, so if you like any of these species, they rely in some part of their life cycle on eelgrass or the species that persist in eelgrass. These are all pictures taken by either myself or some of my staff on either planted in planted eelgrass or natural meadows that are out there, so you recognize a bunch of these, but just know that when there's nothing else in the bottom, they love the eelgrass. It's, it's the only thing there. I like to say that a bay bottom without eelgrass is like a forest without trees, and we have a lot of that going on right now. Many of the species that persist only in eelgrass are some of the smaller ones, or the young of those other ones I just showed you. So we have things like seahorses and pipefish. Uh, this is a neat picture I took, I can't believe it was eight years ago, um, but this is in Cockles Harbor, Shelter Island, and this is a, a nest for stickleback. So it looks like something you'd see an insect creating by weaving together leaves, but this is actually a fish that did that. And if you look really closely, you can see there's actually algae growing in it. So it's gone and gathered all these various things and created this little cocoon where it laid its eggs. Now, I didn't know what it was, so I started to pull it open, so I did that damage, but there are many others here, so I didn't feel too bad, but it's, I think it's a great picture, and you can actually see the little embryo inside here, inside the egg. Here's a uh, young flounder. They, they can hide out in the middle there, so you can just see the, see the outline. They're fine when they're size. When they're bigger in the fluke, they scare the heck out of you because they just explode when you swim on them. So it's pretty amazing. But they hide just as well as, as the young guys. 
Another species which is tied intimately to eelgrass is the bay scallop. Um, we've done a lot of work restoring that. I'll talk about that in just a second, but it's got a two-year life cycle just like the eelgrass grows. Each shoot grows for about two years and dies off, and then it has to branch or produce seeds. With the, the bay scallop, though, the interesting thing is that it actually can attach as a, a young individual up on the blades, off the bottom, so the crabs that Carl was talking about can't reach it unless they climb up the grass to get it. So it's a pretty neat relationship they have there. It also provides wave damping. So when you have these bands of eelgrass, if they're still there, they prevent the this storms of washing the scallops up on the beach. So that's important as well to keep them in the water. And when we saw the dives of eelgrass from the 30s and also from the brown top, we saw drastic declines in the scallop populations. Quickly, this is not what I'm here to talk about, but since we talked about shellfish earlier, we have a scallop program that we're working on that something similar to what TNC's uh, doing in, in Great South Bay, but we've been doing this for a while, and um, it's actually working pretty well. So this, in theory, it works if you get enough animals in a small enough space. In our case, we hold a million animals in a spawner sanctuary. They can spread throughout the estuary. And there's a paper that came out last year to talk about how that process uh, uh, took place. And I could talk about that later if you'd like. Eelgrass Biology 101, just like any other plant, it propagates two different ways. Sexually, by producing seeds, it produces pollen, has stigmas, everything a normal plant would have, but underwater, it can also divide clonally. Clonally is the, the main method of propagation in natural systems. Uh, for seeds, you've got these reproductive shoots that will actually grow up and above the canopy. This is a seed that's actually only about five millimeters long, so quite small. Uh, there are seedlings on the bottom there. Seeds get released anywhere from mid to late summer, depending again on water temperature. That's the key there. This is what they look like when they first germinate. So you can actually put them in petri dishes and germinate them, and the seed coat splits and they grow out and grow up out of the bottom. Depending if it's a real, if it's a relatively warm site with relatively high nutrients, it'll grow quickly and look like an adult shoot that first year. The colder sites, that's the seedlings stand out for at least a year, if not two years. Reproduction by division is uh, just a clonal process where they just form these laterals off the nodes and they'll just keep on branching. And that's basically the meadows that are out there tend to be almost uniform or nearly uniform clones because whatever genome gets in, whatever genotype gets in there and thrives, it'll just spread and spread and spread. So some of the older populations are, are not very diverse. This is just a sense of the growth cycle. I don't want to go in, over this in detail, but I just want to show you that it is a cold water species, so there's uh, some growth in the fall and some growth in the spring. In the summer, it has large leaves, but it doesn't put a lot of energy into that. It's really into the spring, moving into the, into the summer. There's too much heat stress in the, in the summer, and it actually will slough off those leaves. That's why you see those mats of leaves on, uh, on the surface of the water on the beach, because it's getting rid of that thing, which is now an energy uh, sucker. It's pulling energy out of the plant. It needs to reserve its energy. <clears throat> OK, why? Restore eelgrass, I think it should be relatively uh, obvious why I want to bring it back. Um, natural recovery is slow, especially through by division and by spreading. Um, and if you pick the right spot, it actually works. So I'll show you that in a moment. A brief history of restoration on Long Island. Some of the first work was back in the 30s, soon after the wasting disease. They noticed that the branch population had come way down because the branch used to come here and feed on eelgrass in, in large numbers. Interesting thing about this is that we talk about genetics today. When they did this work, they actually brought plants from Washington State and planted them here in Great South Bay. Now, I have no evidence that they ever survived for any length of time, but that's pretty crazy stuff if you think about it today. We would never think about moving plants across, you know, from one side of the country to another, or even between estuaries in some cases now. Um, more recently, Dr. Jerry Churchill at Delphi did a lot of pioneering work on seeds. A lot in Great South Bay, as well as some in the Peconics. And then Bill Dennison was here for a short period of time, did some work with seeds. And that's when Cornell started working with him uh, just before I started. Uh, that one of my colleagues was doing some seed work with him. And then I began in the 90s to work on, uh, with the town of East Hampton. And then eventually out in Long Island Sound, where we had our successes. These are uh, some of our restoration sites, not all of them. Obviously, we're right here. So we've tried all over the place. Um, our greatest successes are are out here, some down here, uh, a little bit here, and I slip. 
When you talk about restoring eelgrass, the most important thing is site selection. Doesn't matter what method you use, you can, if you get the timing right, that's fine, but if you don't have the right site, it's not gonna survive no matter what you do. So this is uh, parameters that we have developed and thought about over the, some from the literature, some that we've actually worked out. And this is great. You can measure all these things and check it out and the nutrients and, but you know, water samples are expensive, difficult to collect, collect in some cases. And then what's that point in time mean to you? I like to look at things that integrate conditions over time. So I'll look at things like percent organic matter um, or silts and clays, one thing. But the other thing that we do <clears throat> is a more empirical method. And you may have seen this, this sign before, which I thought was pretty cool. Um, <laughs> How to forecast weather, so if the stone is wet, it's raining, if it's waving, it's windy, if it's got white on top, it's, it's snowing, so. Anyway, but this, this is why I'm showing this to you. What I do, or what we do, is we look at the rocks. So this is, in particular, in the sound. We look at the rocks, and the rocks tell us water quality, light, uh, bioturbation, all those things. So these are all sites that are suitable for eelgrass, il more or less. And I know this is one that's off uh, Great Gull Island. We're, where we've planted, I'll talk about in a moment. Uh, Great Gull Island, that's typical for there. This is off of Fisher's Island. We haven't planted there because we haven't had to, but we've done a lot of research and observation out there. Uh, this is in Long Island Sound off the North Fork where we've had some amazing successes there. And this is further to the west. So there's a change in water clarity. There's also, you see the greens. This is, sorry about the picture, the light's not so great, but um, looks much better on my laptop. But this, this is green algae. Once you start to see those, you know there's more nutrients. So again, you want to look at something that integrates conditions over the entire year. You're not just taking one sample, you're looking at conditions over time. <clears throat> rocks are usually good, but rocks are not always good. So this is a site where rocks are not good because it looks similar to the other ones, but what you're missing here is that attached macroalgae. So what's happened here is either there's too much wave energy and scouring, or in this case, actually, these were buried a month before we got there, and we didn't know it. So the sand moves that much. So if, there was, if it was a good site, you'd have growth on it like, you know, like this, or like this, or like this. So it took a little while to figure that out. Um, here are some other sites. Again, I like to kind of just base it on empirical evidence and observation. And um, these are some sites. I mentioned mud. This is a site where, this is probably one of the creeks in the Peconics. Gracilaria, I believe, or I'm not sure the species are for sure, but Totally unsuitable for growing eelgrass. We've tried many, many, many times. Eelgrass will die here in about two weeks if you plant it in that. It'll get poisoned by the sulfur that's, that's in the sediment. This is a site that looks a little better, but when you see shell like this, that means that there's crabs just constantly turning it over like a rototiller. So plants here would last for three weeks, maybe a month. Here's a site with sand ripples, very small ripples you can observe. That's a site where the currents are probably too high. And here's a site which you can't see it because you're seeing the, the light from the surface, but sand waves, which as you're swimming, you can't see them because the scale of the sand waves can be the width of the stage. But you can plant in what looks like a suitable site and come back the next season and it's buried under this much sand or it's been eroded that much. So you have to be aware of these things and look for those cues in nature. Other things which, again, I don't have time to get into are things like uh, beneficial grazers. This is a picture of Lacuna vincta, which is a snail that grows in the sound. It's actually moving into, uh, that's actually moving north here because it's a cold water species. But we think this is key to some of our success because it constantly cleans off those blades, makes sure there's maximum light reaching those plants. It's very important. Little tiny guy. This is, this, uh, this is against a penny. We've had uh, sites, the peconics were planted. It's too warm for this species, but there's other species. We've been in the process of planting eelgrass, and the snails are there on the bottom. And while we're there, they come and they climb up on the eelgrass and clean them off while we're there. So we have videos of this. So I guess they want that food. There's nothing else in the bottom. So we introduce this habitat. They want to use it, and there's food there. In terms of planting methods, uh, you can look at using seeds or shoots. And I'll talk about these really quickly. Simplest method with seeds is broadcast seeding. This is something I'll mention in a second. Um, for seed collection, this is, it's a science and it's an art as well. I have one person on staff who's responsible for tracking the maturity of eelgrass flowers into seeds, and it changes from year to year to year. So if somebody plans an event, 
a year ahead of time or two months ahead of time, they're gonna miss that window because there's a two week window where you have to collect your seeds. If you collect too early, they're all gonna abort. If you collect too late, they're already gone. So we go out there on a weekly basis to monitor these, these beds and each bed is different. So the estuaries are quite different. So something in Shinnecock Bay is gonna mature usually in the last week in June, first week in July. Out in the Sound by Fisher's Island it could be September, it could be, could be August. So there's quite a range. So that's something that it's not to be taken lightly and you can waste a lot of time by collecting too early or too late. Um, the process is just bring them back when they're relatively mature but not quite falling out, put them into these tanks, flow seawater, eventually separate them from all the extraneous material and then you have these containers of beautiful pure seeds. Here are some of them germinating and here, are them germ here they are germinating in trays. Uh, but you can also, like you saw, Kim, to broadcast seed onto the bottom like Carl was showing with the clams, same, same process. Buoy deployed seeding is something that we developed in Sag Harbor and it's been used in Portugal, in, uh, in Germany, in uh, um, San Francisco Bay. They repopulated San Francisco Bay with this method. Basically what we're doing here is kind of alleviating the need for all these tanks and this facility that uses quite a bit of power and just taking and collecting the flowers and putting them into these small pearl nets just before they're ready to, to be released. And we set them out in arrays similar to a mooring field. This is Sag Harbor Causeway here. And they'll just drop their seeds in kind of a donut around that spot. And you'll come back and see seedlings growing up there, assuming the site is correct. So that's a great system that works out pretty well. Another thing we do, now moving on to the plant side of things, the, the adult shoot plant side. Um, it's a lot of labor planting these things by hand, as you can imagine for divers. Imagine planting your lawn in a wetsuit, you know, on your hands and knees. It would take you forever, so you don't want to do that. So anything that you could do to save labor underwater, we would try that. So this is a system we came up with a number of years ago where we use volunteers to weave eelgrass shoots into biodegradable burlap discs that can then be planted in the bottom by divers. So rather than planting one shoot at a time, they're planting 10 shoots at a time. And people love it. It's kind of like knitting circle. They chat, they talk. It's, it's a great time. This is the process. Uh, we collect by hand the shoots along the eroded edge of, edges of existing meadows, bring them back, um, have volunteers weave them into these tortillas, we call them. And then they uh, get put into greenhouse temporarily. Then eventually they get planted out in the bottom. And we're good to go. And this is what they look like. This is, uh, these are some actually we were planting in Jamaica Bay of all places. And that's just the process. We actually have a PVC ring sticking to the bottom. You kind of dig it out with your hand, put the disc in, put sand back, pull the ring out, and voila, you've got 10 shoots there. So it looks like a seedling that's two years old, basically. Another system that uh, we developed, this one I developed out of frustration where we were hand planting. This is in 2004, and we had planted a large area about the size of the stage. It was doing really well, and we had a storm, I just ripped it all out. Just everything was gone. So, was so depressed. I, I, we had come there with plants to plant more. So I was like, what am I gonna do with these plants? So I swam away from the other diver, went into deeper water, and saw rocks, and just started jamming plants under rocks. Just, I gotta do something with these guys. And lo and behold, that method took off and really works well. So the beauty of it is, is that it holds the plants in place until they can root. So if you have a case where there's erosion, that rock's not going anywhere. We're talking about rocks that are fist size or this size. They're not gonna go anywhere. Or if you get over burial, the plants will stay there as well. So it works in both cases. This is what the bottom typically looks like in one of our rock planting sites. This is the same site where we started the technology. I call it technology. It's, it's like caveman stuff, but um, it's a technology to us and it works, it's a method. This is the before and uh, this is after at the same site. So, Eelgrass is an ecosystem engineer, so when it grows, it changes the environment around it. So it'll change the sediment texture and type, it'll pump organic matter into the sediment. It'll also trap sand like a snow fence or like a sand fence. So in this case, that sand has come in and buried all the rocks that were there, and lo and behold, you get these flounders showing up. And this is back in 2007, but we would go every couple weeks, and these guys would show up, and they want to get fed. And they'd get, come up, and we'd give them deckers or capitula, and they'd suck them out of the shell here, and they'd come. And they were like our pets. It was the coolest thing. And if I didn't feed him, he'd come closer and closer. And then, you know, he just, get, they were getting really aggressive, but at least we, we were keeping somebody happy, you know. Um, so the funders like that as well. And that was National Fish and Wildlife Foundation. Um, in terms of our successes, uh, 
the best we've done is on the North Fork on the East End, and these sites here, and I, if Helen was awake, I would show her this site. But, <laughs> sit out here, Grakel Island, we actually had some really great success, amazing. We were planted on both sides of the island, unbeknownst to Helen or to anybody, but it's a great site. Um, our most famous site for us is St. Thomas Point, and this is Terry's Point here. And I've got, this is, these are captures from last year's uh, video survey. So they're so big now, we use, you know, video camera to swim through the meadow and check it out. But here's a kind of a skate going through one of the spots. But you can see, I mean, you, you can't tell it's planted. It looks like it's been there forever. And it, the key, the interesting thing, though, is that we can't prove there was ever grass here. Because if you look at the old aerials, the signature for eelgrass is the same as for rocks and for algae. So we don't know that it ever was there, but it's there now. And we figure any port in a storm. And there's enough rock algae habitat in the sound. We're not worried about displacing that. So that's a little sidebar. Here's one of the sites, Terry's Point. And this is just showing the year of the planting. So pretty pitiful, uh, just showing that these are small rocks, but they're also blue mussels, which is kind of cool. They were growing in amongst it, holding everything together. This is a year later. We're actually, we're out there and grading the whole thing out and counting all the shoots to come up with this kind of heat map of where the plants were growing into. And then this is another uh, year. And you get, again, you can see that, that change from this to this. See the sand moves in, it traps that sand, so it engineers that, that environment. Uh, the same thing for St. Thomas Point. This is that first rock planting site. And this is uh, two years later and three years later. And you know we're eight years or whatever, nine years beyond that now. So. It's doing really, really, really well, and we're, we're proud of that work. So it, it does work if you, if you have the right spot. Uh, looking at light and temperature, so getting back to the Baconic Keshray, which we haven't really had success planting. We were trying to figure out why. We had a pretty good idea of why, but we wanted to, to prove it with some data. And we basically found that, again, I, you remember that map that showed the green band all around the entire estuary, and the, the existing meadows are only here now? Well, that's what we have. So we have classified this as our meadow sites where the meadows are. So obviously conditions are at least adequate to grow eelgrass right now. It may be still declining, but it's not as bad um, as it would be in here. Our middle estuary and our western estuary. And bear with me here, but this is a pretty interesting story, believe it or not. Um, remember 25 degrees Celsius, so the x-axis is the temperature, the y is number of hours of light above a certain level, so H sat, saturation. So more than enough uh, light for a plant. So it likes to have eight hours of HSAT per day. So the green stations are where the meadows are. The red maroon is the mid, and the yellow is the western. So in June, everybody's, everything's hunky-dory. It's all looking good. They're all in the, you, wanna, you wanna be in this zone up here. As July comes, you see those temperatures increasing and all the sites are migrating to the right of that axis, marching towards that 25. July, August is when temperature peaks. So in this case, we see that in August, those good sites, the meadow sites, had more than enough light and they stayed below that 25. But the bad sites kind of migrated down to that zone where they have just enough, if not too little light, but they definitely went above that temperature threshold. Once you move into September, they're all back together again and you're good to go. And then they start to migrate up this way and cooler this way. So I actually want to do an animation showing these things separating out and coming back together at some point. But um, this was really important to us because I had spent the first 15 years of my career planting eelgrass in September, in the fall. And I could plant it anywhere and it'll grow. It'll grow well for the most part, except for in the straight mud, until July or August and then it'll die. So you can never get a year unless you have a good site. So, this explains what was happening. That temperature was just getting pushed out just above that threshold, and that was, that was it. But once you, once you get past it, it'll grow again. So anyway, if you want like, a, like an annual eelgrass, you can do that anywhere. So seawater temperatures are increasing. Unfortunately, we happen to be in a zone where we're seeing uh, greater than average, normal, I don't know what the term should be, increase in temperature. So, that's not gonna change anytime soon. So we're right up here. So that's kind of a problem. Some data from the Baconic Estuary. I wanna talk about an outlier that's very warm and grass is persisting there. And, uh, and I wanna hopefully explain why. So it's a little complicated, but just look at this line here and the red is bad. So these are days, 
greater than 27 degrees Celsius. So 2014 was a cool year. Everybody was happy. Eelgrass was happy. Before that, it wasn't doing so well. Um, we're back up to kind of normal these days as of last year, but eelgrass should not be living in Bullhead Bay based on you know, the theory of temperature being a problem. So what's going on there? Again, it's, it's in the, the western third of the estuary. It's in this enclosed embayment, which is like, literally like a bathtub. So uh, quickly, we uh, noticed that it was rebounding. So something had to be up there. What's going on there? And we thought about um, groundwater seepage, something we work on quite a bit. And Carl had mentioned that as well. I was starting to think about that. And we thought that maybe groundwater could be keeping the eelgrass cool. So we started to do some pre preliminary work. Um, this is showing uh, the National Golf Links in Southampton. And I'm not going to be talking about pesticides because I don't know what's going on with that. That's a different story entirely. But in terms of groundwater, groundwater is typically cool. It's about 55 degrees Fahrenheit year round. So that's cool water coming into your system. So it, it's a hilly area that's running into Bullhead Bay where the grass is. This is a pond. That's not the bay. This is the bay here. This shows temperatures. Unfortunately, we're missing a couple years in the middle, but showing Bullhead Bay. And this is a temperature just above the bottom. So it's where the grass grows, but not where the meristem or the rhizome is. And it shows that in recent years, uh, I don't have 2015 on here, the temperature not only is higher, but it seems to get higher sooner for whatever reasons. I don't know what's going on there. Again, I don't have time to, to even think about it at the moment. This is uh, some of the, the work that we had done, collaborated on. Um, and this is looking at pore water in the sediment, looking at the salinity of that pore water or the conductivity. So basically what you want to... This is the golf course here. The grass is growing here. This is where it persists after the major die-off up along the shoreline. It died off throughout the rest of this. It's coming back from here. What you want to see here is that the more, the, the warmer the color, the, uh, the higher the conductivity, the higher the salt. So you want to see the blue. So these blue stations are where the fresh water is percolating up from the bottom into the, into the creek system. So obviously that's what's happening there. This is some other technology we have access to, which is a seepage meter, which you can put on the bottom and measure that flow out of the bottom. Also, this other stinger, which measures conductivity and straight lines across the bottom, can kind of target where it's coming out. And uh, this is a, what's called an ultra seat, which I've worked with quite a bit. Again, measuring that flow of water in or out of the bottom, either way. But one thing we did last year, which was uh, taking a step back technology-wise, was I didn't want to have to use these fancy machines, which are expensive to use, and you have to have divers and the gear and everything. Um, came up with this idea, where we're just using PVC and temperature loggers situated in the ends of these guys. So we put this thing down. I'll show you a diagram of the whole thing in a minute. But we push it down so that that one of the loggers is right at just below the sediment surface, where that meristem, where that rhizome is, and that's the growing point. That's the most important part of the plant. That's that one. This one is about six inches above the bottom, which is where we typically measure temperature for all that data that I showed. It's, we use a small half cement block and put the logger on top of that. And this is in the canopy above. And then we also had um, actually one that we would tether six inches, six inches deeper, so quite a bit over here. So I'll show you here. This is kind of mimicking what the eelgrass would look like. This is the meristem region, which has to be kept cool. Uh, so this is, and this is what it looks like. So bear with me just for a second. This is one of the most important slides. So again, the golf course, Bullhead Bay. Um, what you're looking at is about three days worth of data. This is in August of last year, August or early September. We were a little late for it. This is away from the, the sloping shoreline. So you would expect kind of minimum input from groundwater. And what you're seeing here, are the blue is, is that just below the sediment where that meristem would be. The, uh, the red is a six, or orange is six inches, this white is 18 inches above. So you see that, again, 25, that magic 25 number is right here. Everything stays above that. It just, you know, there's no influence of groundwater there whatsoever. Whereas this one, which is up along this bank, you're seeing that where that meristem is, it's being kept cool by the groundwater. So the groundwater's coming in and cooling it. It's like a cooling system. It's like putting ice in the system. You're also seeing an impact on the water six inches above the bottom. So, so much water is coming out that it's even cooling that. And that was a dry year. We didn't get much rain last year, especially that period. So we're going to be doing some next week. We'll see an inversion of the temperatures, but it'll still give us a sense of the, of the, the drive we have coming out of the bottom. But that was exciting to me. 
and this is kind of blowing up just one day's worth of data, but this uh, is below the sediment surface, and this is in the canopy above, and this is below, and this is the, the tide. So it's kind of forcing it. It'll hold the water back in the bottom, let the water out of the bottom, back and forth. So what does this all mean? Um, hopefully Bullhead Bay is a harbinger for better things for eelgrass in the, in the estuary, in the Peconics in particular. And we're hoping that we can actually scout for sites using that simple PVC temperature logger device to look for areas of seepage. We know where that some areas are. Will it stay cold enough to keep eelgrass alive? You know, we, we'll have to, that remains to be seen. But these are some sites we're going to be looking at. Cold Spring Pond, that's the name. Uh, Bullhead Bay is right here. There's some areas off of Jessup's. Uh, Sag Harbor Cove may have some spots. We did our first work in the early 90s. Uh, there's a spot in Three Mile Harbor where there's still grass way up inside. We think there's fresh water seeping into that spot as well. So uh, there are possibilities out there. And if we hadn't been out there monitoring year after year and making these observations, we wouldn't know anything about it. So that just gives you a sense of why monitoring is important, and that's it. Any questions? Are you guys just ready to go home? Questions? Chris is the last one. We have time. Okay. Uh, the um, grazer snail, um, is, is that significant enough to employ as, as a management or restorative, something that will en enhance restoration? If you were to spread the snails, are they native? Um, things like that. And also, does the salinity change from groundwater seepage with the temperature change? OK, two questions. The first question, um, would we consider moving snails around to help facilitate or assist restoration? And I'm not going to tell you it didn't cross my mind. Uh, but I don't think that we have to because most of the areas we plant into have the snails already. And they also will travel on little mucus threads and they'll drift through and, and find their way if they're not happy. So I don't think we have to. Um, they'll basically find it. If you plant the stuff, they will come. So that's, that's the good thing. In terms of uh, salinity and, and the groundwater, obviously it's reducing the salinity, but this species can grow down to, to brackish water, so it's not going to be a concern. Hey, enjoyed your talk. Um, so you brought up something before talking about non-native genotypes. Yeah. And uh, here's an issue and, a, and another comment I think was made about climate change. And here's something where obviously temperature is a stressor. Do you think that maybe this would be a, uh, an occasion where, you know, we're looking at the same species, but we're looking at maybe a genotype that's adapted to a slightly shifted temperature range that might have some application? Uh, good question, and we actually have looked at that a number of years ago. I brought up plants in the lab from North Carolina, which was the southern limit at the time, and grew them side by side with our plants, and they didn't persist well because they're diminutive, very small plants, and there wasn't enough biomass for them to withstand our higher temperatures. Now, you think it's, it's warmer down there, it is, but they have a little bit of a different growth cycle. It's bimodal. They have just that spring and fall. We kind of grow throughout the summer a little bit. But um, long story short, I don't think there's enough of a variability, or you might get a half a degree, maybe. I think that the better bet's gonna be, I hate to say it, but you know, 50 years bringing other species up, you know, turtle grass or something. The issue now is that these semi-tropical species can't handle our winters, so that's a limiting factor now. But there are species that occur in Portugal, which is pretty similar, which they can almost grow here. I would never bring them over, but it's right at the cusp. So if we want to have this habitat, we may need to think about engineering at that scale and have that impact. Great talk, Chris. Thanks. Um, first, I, have a, I hope it's a quick question, and then I wanted to share what I think is an observation of another benefit of seagrass. So um, the question is about the seeds. What is it about these eelgrass seeds that when you cast them out, um, they drop to the bottom and don't just get carried away? Uh, why would they, when they drop off a plant, seed fairly close to the plant and not be carried off? They're negatively buoyant. They've evolved that way because they, it's, they grow best when they're near adult plants. They need that protection, that quiescent zone. If you plant them by themselves, unless the bottom is ideal, unless there are little perforations and holes in the bottom from snails and worms and what have you, they'll either get buried too deeply or get scoured away. So that can happen. But if you, 
you can actually measure the viability of an eelgrass seed by putting it in seawater and seeing how fast it sinks. The faster so the, they the sink, the more... The good ones sink fast. Yes, exactly. Oh, yeah. So it's like a little depth charge. You put them down, they go right down ah, to the bottom. You know? okay. And it, depending on the current, they'll go you know, like this to the bottom. Almost like you're putting, again, in shellfish, they'll, they'll do the same thing. So they've evolved to do that. Now, one of the things that was uh, determined years ago, it's somewhat obvious, but it was proven that that's one means of spread. They did this in the Chesapeake, where you can show that the species can spread hundreds of miles because those reproductive shoots can get ripped up drift along, they continue to mature as they're in the, the rapidia, and then they can drop the seeds like our system, but somewhere else. And if they happen to drop in the perfect spot, they'll grow and establish a new colony. And they've seen that in the, in the coastal bay system in the Chesapeake. Thank you, that's very interesting. So my observation was one day, about 10 years ago, on the north side of Great South Bay, uh, near Heckscher, I guess somewhere in Heckscher Park. And I had about an hour to kill, and I was bored, and I was just staring. And so I, was, I noticed there were big mats of dead eelgrass that had washed up on the shore. And it was a very windy day. And um, the reason I was there is my friend was windsurfing and I couldn't see him anymore, so I just had to occupy my own time. And I noticed that as the waves were hitting the eelgrass, which were on the shore, right at the edge of the water, the energy of the wave seemed to disappear into the mat. And right next to the eelgrass, where there was no, these dead mats, um, right next to, the waves were coming further up onto the beach and scouring away the sand. So I took a, I thought, what is it about this mat of eelgrass that's preventing erosion? And I started to look and watch it for, you know, a good long period of time. And I realized that the dead eelgrass combined with the water and it might be because of the high silica that I heard about today from you, thank you, um, seemed to be creating a colloid. It was almost gelatinous, and these, these mats were about, I don't know, one and a half to two feet thick and probably two feet wide, and they extended along. And they would just sort of fill with water instead of letting the water pass through up onto the sand. Oh. So I thought to myself, Gee, we need more eelgrass for that too. <laughs> it's, um, it's, it's possibly providing erosion control when it's dead. So. And I, even when it's alive too as well, obviously. But that, yeah. that's a great observation. And basically when a wave forms and, and propagates, it's, it's atoms hitting atoms. So anything that breaks that up is gonna help dampen that wave energy. So that's what's happening there. That, that, that rotation's not able to happen. And you, you made me think of one more thing about seed spread. I thought you were gonna mention this. Um, one of the things that uh, Jerry Churchill observed, which is pretty interesting in terms of seeds moving, is if the water is very, very still, and I've seen this only twice in my life, and it's, it's uh, the time of year when the, the seeds are being released, you get photosynthesis happening, bubbles forming on the reproductive structures, and a bubble will actually attach to the seed, bring it to the surface, and then it will float, 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 until it hits a ripple, then it'll drop. Ooh. So that's another thing, so, that's so anyway. Cool. Hi. My last question. Um, I was wondering if there's been any studies being done in the fishery in general, and seeing as you've lost the eelgrass, has there been any noticeable change in the fishery in these areas that you're looking in? Because you have all these pictures of fish that are yeah. in the eelgrass. When it's not there, is there certain things happening that you're, certain fish you're not seeing anymore? Uh, the, the short answer is we're not seeing as many or the types of fish we used to. Now, whether that is causal, we can actually quantify that as a different thing, and that's the problem. Um, we try to do some fisheries work, but just to set the traps and figure it out and get enough data that's not so noisy that you're you know, picking up on you know, variability is very difficult. But anecdotally, just looking out there, you're not seeing the species that you're used to, and there's just no habitat for them. It's just it's not there. Now, my, my colleagues and friends working on scallops will say, well, they can use other species, and they can. They'll attach to grass solaria and some other, other plants that are out there, but eelgrass is the ideal habitat for that, but we don't see as many seahorses. We don't see as many puffer fish. We don't see, you know, a lot of things, so it's just unfortunate, and the other problem is that where we're planting it is not the ideal habitat for those smaller species. We're keeping the eelgrass species alive and supporting some species, but not all the ones you'd have in the in this quiet coves and places like that, because where we're planting it, the waves pass through it and it kind of does this. It's really beautiful to see, but uh, we're not seeing seahorses out there, for example, or pipefish for the most part. Thank you.
Thanks. Okay, thanks, Chris. Thank you.